comprehensive presentations. I can see some arbitration fatigue setting in, but I'm still going to invite questions from <laughs> questions from the audience to or panel. Member. I know Jeff was diverted to St. Croix um, on his way from Bermuda, so I'm sure he'd like at least one question. One of the areas where the court has uh, a uh, role is in relation to Article 16 of the Model Law, which is where there is um, a challenge to the tribunal uh, as to jurisdiction. And the tribunal decides that it does have jurisdiction as a preliminary question. Uh, there is then a determination by the court upon the application of the unsuccessful party uh, and no appeal from that decision. Uh, in the uh, uh, Singapore jurisdiction, there has been an interesting decision by the Singapore Court of Appeal that um, even though a party against whom a decision on jurisdiction has been made by a tribunal does not exercise a right under Article 16 and waits to see whether it wins the case, it can then, on an enforcement application in the seat, challenge jurisdiction. The Hong Kong Court of First Instance has said he doesn't think that makes sense. That's going to be an interesting issue if it comes before the courts of the BVI because what it means, if the Singapore court is right, is that a party can force the other party to waste all its money on what turns out to be an arbitration that had no substance. Do either of you have views about that? <laughs> continuing arbitration when you know there's a challenge you can make would certainly in terms of the justice of the case leaving aside the specific language of the particular provision would certainly seem to mean that the party could not afterwards raise it but obviously there's clearly better minds at work on that point than mine and uh, I, I certainly for one if I had any opportunity to adjudicate would always say a party can't sit in their hands when they have a valid point and not raise it so, but one day it may come before the learned judge and uh, he will look at the appropriate authorities and somewhere, professor, back in Australia, you'll be able to read his learned judgment and get the real answer. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Thank you. I, I was just wondering, uh, in terms of the role of the court, which is, of course, very limited under the statute, are there or have there been any constitutional issues and points raised with regard to arbitration uh, in other jurisdictions? where it is being said that uh, constitutional rights, whether it be in relation to the role of the court or in relation to the, the parties themselves, particularly as it relates to the conduct of the arbitration, are uh, being violated with uh, a view to frustrating the process if it is felt particularly by uh, a, a party that the outcome is likely not to be favorable for them. When 
when I read the um, PVI Act, I did notice that there is a provision in there whereby the um, labor, uh, certain labor disputes, uh, you can apply to the court to have them referred to arbitration under this act. Now, I'm not quite sure how they were dealt with earlier. Now, whether there's some scope there where a party doesn't want, they believe they have other remedies elsewhere, maybe before the courts, that they're being compelled to go to arbitration and not have their day before the judge, maybe. But in terms of actual case law and in relation to constitutional, I mean, I certainly don't know any. Um, but it's always, it's always a, a, a possible opportunity. I see Jeremy always champs at the bit of taking up the other side of the case. Yeah, and to raise a constitutional argument that you're not uh, getting a, a, a hearing before the courts of the country. Maybe there's something in it, but uh, again, with the pro-enforcement approach in this jurisdiction, I don't hold that much hope for the, uh, for the applicant. I think Calvin Hamilton has a question behind you. This chap here, Calvin Hamilton. I would do justice. A um, couple of couple of couple of points, more than questions, with respect to the professor's um, query just now. I think it, it, it raises the issue about timeliness, um, which of course is something that tribunals and judges uh, need to be very much aware of, um, past factors and the like. So you just propose one, two, three bites of the apple. One. Uh, whether or not you were timely raising the issue uh, during the arbitration process. Having not done it then, whether or not it was most appropriate at the annulment phase, and not having done it, now you've gone to the um, um, recognition and enforcement stage. So I would, I would have thought then somebody has to say, well, enough's enough. Um, and so that, I think, would respond to that question. The other two points I wanted to make are both to do with the rules, and, and that goes to probably um, um, that you should consider when you are drafting the rules. And one is whether or not um, questions of consolidation, although I know you have it in the act that you, you foresee that it, go, it can go, you can raise that at the courts, whether it would not be most appropriate to include in the rules itself uh, whether, uh, the, this question of, of consolidation, because then you're talking about uh, um, um, saving on on uh, litigation costs and the likes. And most rules, if you look around, uh, do provide for consolidation of arbitrations, so, uh, of, of, of different arbitrations. So the tribunal does have uh, the power to, to, to do that. Um, and the other one, uh, with respect to the rules again, would be in your case of the emergency arbitrator. So that in the event that the tribunal has not been established at the time, there is a need for some sort of interim uh, measure and or involvement of somebody to make decisions to preserve property or what have you. Uh, most rules now provide for the emergency arbitrator to help be appointed under those rules. Now you can opt out of it if you want to, but, but, but they do provide for that. And again, what that does is it saves on, saves on litigation costs and, and the likes. Uh, so you would want to provide for those issues in your rules. I know Lord Goldsmith has one comment. Make one comment. It's not quite on the. It's not quite constitutional. But for those who are interested in the question of when the courts can intervene to stop arbitration because someone's claiming that they shouldn't have to arbitrate, it's worth looking at the decision of the Caribbean Court of Justice uh, in BCB against the Attorney General of Belize, which picks up on a, a on an aspect of the common law which has said that sometimes the courts can stop arbitrations on the grounds that they're vexatious or oppressive. Now, the Belize courts and the Belize legislature took that to quite extremes, including mandatory imprisonment for 10 years for breaking the injunction, but the court didn't have a lot of truck with. But, it, but in terms of the principle of when that can be applied and when it can't be applied, uh, the, 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 the judgment of uh, Judge Pollard is worth, is worth reading. I'm told no more questions from Don, so don't chew the messenger. <laughs> Thank you so much.